How you doing? Are you a friendly person? I'm doing as good as a person in my position. All right, welcome everybody. And I didn't coin this term, but it, welcome to Mass this Monday, our first <laughs> community meeting this year. Enjoy. Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United, United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Good morning, everybody. I will note all the board members are present here today, and uh, we're going to get it, take on some business here. Um, I will move to approve the minutes from the February 14, 2022 board meeting. If there's a second, second. Thank you. Any question or comment? Hearing on all those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Move on to uh, move to acknowledge the Secretary of State's Directive, Director 2022-23 concerning data collection, notice, and cancellation procedures for completion of the 2018 national change of address and supplemental process. Directive 2022-24, statewide candidates for the May 3rd, 2022 primary election. Directive 2022-25, ballots and candidates for the May 3rd, 2022 primary election for offices not impacted by redistricting. Directive 2022-26, the state and house Senate district maps and house bill. 93, Directive 2022-27, U.S. House of Representatives districts maps and House Bill 93. And finally, um, uh, acknowledgement of the CCBOE signature stamp policy. If there's a second. Second. Thank you. Are there any questions or comments concerning Thank this? Please. Thank you, um, Mr. Chair. Um, just on the um, Directive 2020, 20, uh, Directive 2022-23, so there's a deadline by tomorrow. Are we going to be mailing those? I guess registration notices. I'm assuming we got a sign off. Will that be going out tomorrow? Yes, those will be going out from uh, registration department. I want to say it's about is it 14,000, buddy? Yeah, about 14,000 that we'll send out. There will not be, um, so this is giving them the notice. So there's no cancellation at this point in time. And then after the primary, uh, we'll do voter history and then we'll go ahead with the cancellation process. Okay, thank you. Um, I just want to acknowledge to the, the signature stamp policy. I mean, that's something new. I know we've all reviewed it, and it's part of the Ohio Elections Manual. I know Peter James can be commenting about that later in the meeting. But um, it's a, I'm glad we have it in writing now, and it was well written and well thought out. So thank you. Um, did I know? I guess on the mailing that picking up on it, Ina Joe's. Did I, I see? I mean, do we have particularly a higher amount than most other counties uh, for these mailings? If, if, if you know. Um, I would say proportionate, just because of the size that we are, we'll have more um, than other counties. But I don't think any of us were surprised with the number, fourteen thousand. That would that would be a normal course of business. I see. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Here, just, just one other. I, I mean, there's some. I know we've been the sec our sector of states trying to navigate all of this, you know, uncertainty and so forth, and we've been given a lot of uh, direction on, um, you know, with, with how to handle the maps and the deadlines for certifying and protest and filing and stuff. I'm assuming we're going to have some of this, that questions around the whole primary thing. Yeah. I assume you're going to cover that later and maybe an update as opposed to going through some of this implicates the directives. And I know it's sort of a fluid process. Um, um, definitely. So I, okay. at the in new business, I do want to okay. give an update and I'll be speaking to some of that craziness. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Any other question or comment? Hearing on all those in favor, signify, signify by saying aye. 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 Motion passes. And I'll acknowledge the resignation from appoint, recognition from appointments to and the death uh, of those in elected office. The resignation of Mr. Stephen Dockman from Maria Board of Education. The appointments to elected office of Gail Larson, Cleveland Heights City Council. Uh, Daniel Jicka, Fairview Park City Council, Kyle Baker, Lakewood City Council, and Johnny Williams, Warrensville Heights City Council, and unfortunately for passing to Ms. Paula Mizak uh, from Redford City Council. If there's a second. Second. Thank you. Any question or comment? Hearing not all those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Um, and I will acknowledge uh, the withdrawal of candidates from the May 3rd, 2022 primary election is set forth in our agenda of Vincent Roseman from State Senate District 21. Shea Hawkins, State Rep, District 15, as well as a write-in, Mr. Hawkins, in District 15. Uh, State Central Committee, uh, Colin Jackson, County Central Committee, uh, Bedford, Paul Miz, Paula Mizak, Dantes Taylor, County Central Committee, and uh, Levita Murray. Um, 
And then also uh, acknowledging uh, Wesley Gretchen Kurtzberger uh, at, at that late filing acknowledgement and Westlake uh, Aaron Godfrey is a write-in February 27th. There's a second? Second. Thank you. Any question or comment? And hearing on all those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Mr. Lawler, good morning. Good morning. I should set us up here for the review of candidate petition service. Fred Lawler, manager, candidate petition services. In front of you, you should have a sheet of paper that has um, five candidates. Um, we did the same um, setup as we did at the last meeting. Uh, two of the candidates, your issue is that they did not complete the circuitry clause and not completely. That would be Matthew, I'll screw that up. Kenneth Carroll, State Central Committee man, uh, Senate District 24 Republican. There's no number of witnesses on the back of the petition, the secretary clause. And we need a Brent State Central Committee woman, Senate District to be determined, Democratic, the same issue. Um, the next one is Catherine Zakowski. Uh, candidate did not indicate the municipality ward or precinct um, for the office she was running for. That was County Social Committee. Carmel Ward 1, Precinct D is a write in. And she didn't have any city ward or precinct. The third one was Mary Jo Lavelle. She was actually removed by the board at the previous meeting, uh, filed them as a write in, which is prohibited from filing two different, two for the office twice, but also once the board takes action, you can't file as a three letter candidate. And the last one is um, Matthew Schaeffer. County Central Committee, Cuyahoga Heights A, it's a write in as a Democrat. Unfortunately, he voted in the primary in 20, in last year as a Republican. So he's not uh, qualified to run as a write in as a Democrat. We would ask the board not certify those five candidates to be re ballot. Um, and are they all aware that they have these issues, Mr. Wall? They're all sent a letter, yes. Yes, okay. Sure. And with Ms. Lavelle, the problem is she could have withdrawn her petitions previously. Yeah, she, we've had that conversation. And, you're supposed to be all cost All right. Uh, I will move to not certify the individuals set forth on our agenda, as set forth by Mr. Lawler, for the reasons uh, also uh, set forth by Mr. Lawler. There's a second. Second. Is there anybody here? Yeah, thank you, uh, Ms. Chappelle. Does anybody here want to be heard on that? Last time we did have some folks there. Right. Yeah. Uh, Ms. Lavelle, Zakowski, uh, then Cara, or, or Mr. Brent, or Mr. Schaffler. Okay, hearing none, we have a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Motion passes. Thank you. And then we'll move on to, well, you know, I'll let one of my colleagues, the Democrats, to make the motion for the next one. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> Certification of the Democratic Central Committee writing candidates and remaining issues for the May 3rd, 2022 primary election. There's a second. Second. Thank you. Any question or comment? Uh, and that includes uh, what? Ms. Bajani, you emailed us on Friday those issues too. Right. Thank you. Um, hearing no questions or comments, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Uh, I will move to approve to appoint not less than two precinct election officials for each precinct pursuant to the revised code section 350122 for the May 3rd, 2022 primary election. If there's a second. <coughs> second. Thank you. Any question or comment? Hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 The motion passes unanimously and on to the, uh, I'll move to approve the, to send the voter information guide for all active voters in Cuyahoga County for the May 3rd primary election. If there's a second. Second. Thank you. I do have a question and I don't want to put Ms. Zussi on the spot, but uh, I see the price is 41872 after bid, correct? Can, yes. And on the second sheet, it, I, I'm, there were numbers on the second sheet, right? Printing for May 3rd. I'm just trying to see how you got to 41872 because I can't get there with the numbers on the second sheet. So on the, on the first chart for the May 3rd, the printing and mailing, that's the 43,000, <coughs> oh, um, it's 43,000, 44,000. Okay, so it's a different. It's a typo, yeah. Okay, so the actual figure is you would add the 26,780 and the 17,664. Correct. Okay, so there was a... And that, thank you. Okay. Now, in regards to this, though, this is kind of in limbo, right, Mr. Pilate? Yeah, so I'd like to speak to that. Okay, thank so, you. And, and I don't know if you want to modify <coughs> our motion to um, a 
approve this for the 2022 gubernatorial primary election, leaving the date absent. Um, Kendra has communicated with uh, the vendor, with Angstrom, and everyone understands that while um, technically right now there is a May 3rd election, everything is in a state of flux. And, and even talking with Mark, uh, we are able to um, award this, and if we award it for the primary election, um, this pricing would stand. And then actually, we don't want to send this until we know for certain when the election is going to be, because as simple as the date of the election appears on this document, and if that were to change, of course, you'd want to change it. If there were to be, for example, two primary elections, uh, we would still, we would want to send one for each. The second one would have to be a second bid, but then we would put a little bit of different information on the first version, drawing the, to the attention of the voters. Hey, in this election, you're voting on, for example, statewide and county contests. And maybe the next one, it would say you're voting on congressional or general assembly type things. So we would want to <coughs> hone in on that. So what we would hope to do is if we were to get approval today, what it, it, would, it would allow, and the vendor understands that, you know, that this everything is in a state of flux. We've given the, uh, the ability to go out and purchase paper at today's current price, um, have it hit, hold on to it, and then the mail services piece, which is the uh, variable data and, and the folding and the inserting of the envelopes would happen whenever that's supposed to happen um, based on when we're ready to send this document. Uh, typically, this document we would, for May third, we would be sending information, um, the the artwork and the data file to them to go ahead and start working on this this week. Uh, our goal is we like to have this hit households about a week before the opening of absentee, and for that to happen, they need to start mailing a week prior to that, and then it takes them a couple weeks to go ahead and pr and produce that document. So uh, we're not giving them. We would not give them the go ahead and start on this process now uh, because we can't or i don't think we or we shouldn't it's uh we don't want to create voter confusion by sending something out that says here's what's going on may 3rd if in fact that fact pattern changes so you're in communication with them yes and you're asking us to pass it now so we can buy the paper lock in that price mm -hmm. and then wait till we know for certain yes exactly i'm going to amend my motion i just need to that i approve this Voter information got in the amount of $44,444.10. Um, and I, I believe there's, a, is there a second? Second, thank you. Are there any other questions for Mr. Pilati or, or Ms. Susan? I just, I just want to be clear. So we are, are going to still be able to maintain the contract price. So there won't be any increase in the contract price, even though they know that, I mean, they're not going to print anything. It's not even about our mailing out. I mean, they're going to print anything until we are, we'll have the flexibility to, change the text and the content and all at the same contract price is that is that what i'm understanding yes and i just got a response from the vendor saying they would hold that pricing for 90 days oh, okay, okay. okay. I, I, another picking up on that so we have this november 2nd 2021 oh that was the price for 2021 okay mm -hmm. yeah, just right. thank you any other question or you know, I'm glad. I'm just thankful that we have the ability to have some flexibility here because, you know, we shouldn't be approving anything, and you know, then we get a change and then we spent the money. So that's great. Yeah. Thank you. Any and hearing no other question or comment, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 The motion passes unanimously. I'll move to approve the vouchers to set forth in our uh, <clears throat> board package. If there's a second. Second. If you any question or comment, please. I, I do have a question. So. Yes. This, um, the one software item, that doesn't relate to the, uh, what was the election force item. So we're not, that we, we suspended the use of that product and all that, so. That is correct. So okay. these are three different um, standalone products, the 10X University, that is used by the Polar Department. That's actually the platform for the online training. Mm -hmm. So we have the videos, um, the asset inventory management, that is uh, primarily utilized by election support right now, Vic and his shop, to um, keep tabs on everything we have. And then the last one is our actual electronic uh, poll book. And that is. Okay, it's an EPB software issue, not. not uh, correct. Okay, yeah. thank you. Any other questions or comments? 
Hearing mm -hmm. none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Motion passes unanimously. And then uh, we received a letter that Director Berlotti had sent to the board members from Midwest Direct Supply uh, requesting uh, consideration about possibly uh, assisting them in extra costs they're incurring as a result of supply chain issues. You want to tee that up, Mr. Pilati? Sure. So Midwest uh, Direct initially uh, communicated, reached out with um, our ballot department as part of the planning to get numbers on <clears throat> how many vote by mails do we anticipate going out for the May primary? And they also then asked a question, hey, we're hearing in media, potentially there's the potential for two elections, a second primary. And, um, and the best, all our staff would say is we put that in the media too. So Midwest, in anticipation of that, went out and purchased additional envelopes and materials if they had to double up on having an additional primary election. We did not direct them to do that. It's something that they were trying to be proactive and do that. Well, the cost of paper is on the rise. They went ahead and they did make that purchase. And now they have that. They are paying more for materials now than they did before. So they reached out to me and said, you know, can the board do anything about that? I said, I don't know. We have a contract. If you give us something in writing, we'll share it with the prosecutor's office. They can review and see if there's any kind of flexibility. And then we'll go ahead and present the document to the board, promising them nothing other than I would take the letter, share it with Mark, and then ultimately put it before the board. I think they should take it up with the Ohio legislature. Yeah. That's what we can tell them. Because how, how many boards of elections do they service in the state of Ohio? A lot, correct? Several. <clears throat> yeah. So before we make a move here, Take it up with uh, rep sites and, and the rest of his gang down there. It just seems to me that, um, you know, we have a binding contract in there, um, a valued vendor, but um, imagine the slippery slope that we would be going down if, you know, every vendor came back and said, mm -hmm. we have staffing shortages. We get it, there's staffing shortages, mm -hmm. uh, but that's part of their cost of doing business. Actually, I'm surprised that there's no escalators or anything in that. But remind me, I, are there escalators in there to deal with price increases? Most vendors would have some sort of escalation. It seemed to me we'd have to rebid and do all that kind of stuff, but we couldn't give them any competitive advantage. I don't know. Mark, can you advise us on or you know get some can get some input about it? Just doesn't seem like we have it would be appropriate or even legally permissible for us to um, make a change based on this letter anyway. Right. When we bid this, we um, provided them with an opportunity to price this year's uh, cost of, of the service that did go up from the prior year's bid, uh, but that is locked in. There is no commodity index adjustment up or down. If they don't pass through any savings in the event the commodity price goes down. Uh, we don't pay for that risk that they take on when entering those line items. So, I mean, to pick up on, we bid this out, correct? And that, yes. everybody got a chance to bid on it. Right. Are we even allowed by law to consider this mark? No, it would be totally gratuitous. Um, and you would run into a problem with other vendors that would have possibly bid uh, and won had we provided this opportunity. I, I'm, I understand. I mean, I appreciate they feel they can ask, and that's okay. There's no harm. But I, I just, matter of law, we're just not permitted to do it. No. I have, and, and I think that needs to be conveyed to them. You understand. How much. Ms. Lucy, are they asking, do you know? I mean, they're, is there a dollar amount they put on it? They said, hey, we, we got a 33% increase in what we anticipated. They, they did outline some numbers of yeah. percentages, variables. Yes. So in a conversation with them, yeah, they didn't get into an exact amount, but it's probably in the range, I think about 10 to $15,000. I, I, I'm sorry. No, go ahead. I just, I mean, I have a fun, but I mean, I know they're a value. They've done a great job for us and I'm not trying to minimize um, that at all. I just have a problem with the, the way the letters phrase, honestly. I mean, how is a public sector tax, you know, we are funded with taxpayer dollars going to lend assistance to a private entity. I, I mean, I, I guess I understand the spirit in which they are asking, but it just fundamentally, it doesn't, it resonates with me in a, a really strange way. Um, but it seems like we have you've given us the answer that um, you know it's it's legally prohibited. Unfortunately, and, our hands are tied, and it's not even something we yeah. should 
Okay, I should have done it. Um, I, I guess that provide. I don't know that we have need to take a motion on this, do we? Or just provide you with some direction? Um, I provide direction. Sorry, I, I can send a letter or an email to the. Well, I, you know, just as a matter of, I will make a motion that you know the the, the board can uh, not uh, provide any further assistance to, to Midwest Direct just because we're prohibited by law. That's the reason. There's a second. Second. Okay. Any, any other question or comment? One, one last question. Did or, or didn't we just approve? Isn't it? Aren't they? We don't we have a short term arrangement? It's just through the rest of this year. Is that correct? So if there's any potential. Price increases, we would likely see them in an, another iteration or in a connection with another bid and bid processing contract. Right. So they're locked in basically through the end of this year. Is that um, correct? So this, the current, there's actually there's three windows. So this window right now will take us through through the primary, and then at our discretion, we can approve for one more the, the final window, which is the the general election. But that pricing is locked in. Pursuant to what when they submitted a bid, it's, it's 18 month okay. um, window six six and six. So we're in that second six, and then the third six. There will be a price increase, because, but that was determined when they submitted it initially. Okay. Yeah. Thank the you. Of there. Yeah. Any other question or comment? Okay. Hearing none. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Thank you. Um, and we have a personnel. I will move to approve the personnel uh, agenda set forth on our. Board package of uh, Robin Bauer uh, hired his position of election official in the election officials department. Brett Charningo is a program coordinator in the ballot department. Caitlin Sweeney is an election official one in the ballot department. Mm -hmm. Julia Brown is an election official two in the registration department. There's a second. Second. One question. Please. Is it Julia or Julie? Her resume says Julie. Is she Julia or Julie? Julia. Okay. She looked like Julie though. Oh, okay, that's why I was confused. Yeah. Okay, all right. Thank you. Okay, any other questions or comments? We're not all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All right, then on to new business. Uh, just real quick, Jeff, there was a few page two oh. with George about it. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you for pointing that out. And I will also uh, move to approve this continued sick leave for Ms. Bobbitt or leave donation. Yes. Right. Leave donation for Ms. Bobbitt if there's a second. Second. Thank you. Any question or comment? Hearing none, all those in favor, signify by aye. 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 Thank you for pointing that out, Mr. Pilati. Mr. James, welcome. Good morning. Why don't you uh, let us know? We've got the update, so why don't you summarize that for us, sir? Sure. Uh, Peter James, Selection and Compliance Administrator. Uh, if you would, please refer to two documents that would have been in your packets. One titled Key Changes to the Election Official Manual, and the other one's Policies Added to the Election Official Manual in 2022. Uh, referring first to the key changes, um, the updated election official manual came out at the end of January of this year. There were several updates. I'll um, just quickly go through, I think, a few of the key of them that you guys might be interested in. The very first one is all board members are now required to participate in the SOS annual summer conference, although they do you know, stipulate that you know, it can be in person, virtually, or by watching a recording. Of the conference soon after it's completed. So that's, I believe that's different from before. I don't believe that was required of board members previously. So that's one update. Um, under voter registration, voter initiated activity, the very last bullets says signing a candidate or issue petition that is verified by the BOE. Previously, this was an optional um, activity that boards could determine whether they wanted to count it as voter initiated activity uh, for that given voter. Now it is required of all boards to do that. Um, Cuyahoga has been doing, has been using this as voter initiated activity for several years. So this is no change, but all counties are not required. Uh, the next section, uh, you know, when a voter registers, we send out an acknowledgement card to acknowledge that registration. If it comes back undeliverable, uh, we then follow up by sending a confirmation notice by forward mail to that voter, and that voter becomes an actor. <coughs> Previously, I mean, that would start that, you know, the four-year clock. Previously, that would have been the end of the notice, and the four years went by, and there was no voter-initiated activity by that voter. That voter would be canceled. They've added one more step now, a month before canceling a record under this circumstance. Uh, each board is to mail, you know, their registration readiness notice, Form 20. 
to the voter. In essence, it's one last chance 30 days before we would otherwise cancel their the registration. And I just want to follow up real quick. So registration readiness, we already talked about that. And that's a directive that we'll get every year. And we do send this 30 day notice. This is speaking to, as people register on a monthly basis, we will send out, we're required to send out uh, a notice saying, hey, you're registered and this is your, um, your point location and this is your district configuration. If those come back undeliverable, that puts someone into a must vote provisional status. And that isn't part of a registration readiness, it's a different thing. And those people, once they get into that status, if they don't engage in activity after four years, they can be canceled. We never had to send them a 30 day heads up. Now we do. Um, so we will you know, start to do that. So I just wanted to, um, there is a, there's a differentiation. So this is part of routine business now that we'll have to do on a regular basis. Okay, next item. Um, if we receive an NCOA supplemental return notice from a voter with an address outside of Ohio, uh, we are now to cancel that voter's registration. Previously, we were not able to do that. We have to mail Form 10A to the elector and basically hope that they would cancel their registration. If not, you know, they, they then become part of the, you know, the process of which they would be canceled you know, over a four-year period. Uh, but now if we do get a return notice with an address outside of the state of Ohio, we can cancel that voter's registration. So that is a change um, for voter history. The first time this appeared was it actually a directive before the August uh, special congressional election last year. Let's say a voter comes to the polls, they're not registered. Obviously they're gonna have to vote a provisional ballot. That ballot ultimately will not be counted because they weren't registered. Previously that voter would not be given credit for having voted in the election. But now with this change, they will. So in addition to filling out the you know, provisional affirmation statement, which serves as a voter registration, We'll get that voter registered. They're also getting credit for voting in the election. We'll make, make sure we understand the distinction their ballot doesn't count, but they get credit for having participated in the election. So I mean, under in theory, you're gonna have potentially more people having gotten credit for voting in an election than the number of ballots cast because of a circumstance such as this. Um, let's see, a couple more items. Real quick with the post-election audits, just quickly want to touch on, they added, they changed the word. Previously it said boards had to report audit results to the Secretary of State's office within five days. They've now changed and swapped in the word certify post-election audit results within five days after the completion of the audit, which is what we understand is speaking to that we're gonna to have to, the board will have to meet to certify because that's how we certify results. Now we won't have to do this for every audit because not every audit is required by the Secretary of State. So in those instances, I guess we have our discretion on whether we want to certify through a board meeting or just go ahead and report results of the audit. But for those that are required, such as this upcoming primary election, the board will have to meet um, within five days after the completion of the recounts. We, we currently certify already. I mean, we that's always on our docket after we do the audits and so what, we, what we'll do though currently is Brian and crew will finish it, they'll report, and then whenever our next meeting is, we'll certify at that point in time. Could be five days, could be 10 days, you know, whatever it is. Now Just, it's gotta be five days. Like, yeah, five days. Right now it's five days. And it's for those ones that were, like Peter said, required to do. So every general, every November election, and even your primaries. We'll still continue to audit everything, but like say when we have a September, we don't, we won't have to hurry up and have a meeting in five days. Um, what's going to be a little bit challenging for all boards is you don't know if you have a recount after you certify. And so it's not like we can put it, a date on the books right away because you have to see is there a recount or not a recount. Right. And then that impacts when you do your audit. So we'll, uh, more, more reason for you to continue to push for remote meetings or something <laughs> like this where we could come together just for five minutes, you know, and take that uh, action. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. James. Okay, a couple, yeah, a couple more items here under the uh, updates to the EOM. They added a new section called testing and certification of electronic poll books. Um, and underneath that, a section called communication. In there, it details the restrictions on transmitting data, what is permissible, be transmitted, what is prohibited, et cetera. Um, 
so that what was in the EOM were already you know, so currently supporting practices that we're already following with the electronic poll book. So we're we're good there. And then the last one, I think we already sort of knew about this previously because we got a directive um, for when we got those petitions around Christmas for an act to control and regulate adult use cannabis, where a board may not invalidate a part petition solely because the circulating statement includes a number mm -hmm. that is lower than a number of, of signatures. Um, so long as there isn't any other indication or fraud or misrepresentation, that petition would not be invalidated simply because um, the number that they wrote was less than the number of signatures on that petition. Um, okay, any questions on those? You're moving on to the new policies then? Yes, yeah, okay. correct. So, um, I mean, unless you really want me to go through this, I obviously we just passed a signature stamp policy today. That was the first one we wanted to tackle. The, all these policies that are on here were new to the election official manual in 2022. There were some other policies that were in there, but these are all new ones that were not in the previous version of the EOM. I would say pretty much on all these, we've got some type of framework or process that were already in place. We just are going to need to tighten it up and you know actually get it in a formal document such that we did with the signature stamp um, that will bring you know over the next you know weeks and months to get it in a formalized fashion that can be brought before the board. Um, but I think on all these we've you know, are doing something fairly similar to what it is that they're going to be requiring of us. So these are all in process then, public records request? Correct, yeah. And that's I think with all these, we've got, you know, I've checked with Brian about the testing of voting equipment and the ballots and, you know, some of these other things, the you know, post-election audit, where we sort of have processes that we follow. We just maybe, we just don't necessarily have them, you know, written down in a policy-like form. So that will be what our objective will be here over the next couple of months. And did, the, uh, did this director of the OME say um, you have to do this by a certain date and time? Did it, no. Did, no, it did not give. Um, it did not. So, and we do, we have, like Peter saying, we have procedures all over the place. So it's a matter of trying to pull these together and get them in a more, what the standard of policy that we like to present for to the board, you know, um, as opposed to all these different procedures. So we will, we'll chip away at them. And let, let us know. It doesn't have to be now because you want to talk to staff, but maybe give us a date like we anticipate this is all going to be done, you know, end of August and beginning of September. Thank you. And we'll do that. I will say, though, we will want to, we won't sit on something until that point. If we're ready to go, we'll try to go forward. Yes. One question then. So, for instance, if we could have, you know, Mark take a look at the the policies. My only, I think there were some really good amendments made to the, the signature stamp one because there, you know, we, we should have some sort of carve out for where state law dictates, other, especially for the public records request. I don't, it seems like having a policy is built with suspenders. I get it. To, we should have a policy to incorporate whatever our process is mm -hmm. into the policy, but clearly it can't conflict with the state law. But so making sure that maybe the policies have some sort of you know, catch all that, you know, as is consistent with state law or something. So our policy doesn't end up saying something other than what state law or, or directive or, or something would require. So just make sure we have that in there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. I appreciate the update. And there's a lot of hard work going with that. Thank you. Yes. Okay. Mr. Pilati, new business. So yeah, I want to give want to give an election update. I'm kind of kind of if I can, I'll do it like in just two little two parts. So first, I want to talk about just briefly poll worker training and poll location changes that we're working on. And then the second part is I'll get into um, going back to like some of these directives that we have and how that impacts this agency. So first, uh, for May third, the the training window started this past Friday, March fourth. Um, and we, in fact, started that. Uh, we sent out the online training link to 825 workers for them to start taking online training. Uh, we had 71 individuals signed up for in-person classes Friday and Saturday over the weekend. And then for, uh, as of last Friday, for this upcoming week, we have 281 individuals signed up to, to, to have classes. We have to do this because again, as of now, there's a May 3rd election and we need to start going down that path. One thing that I guess gives me a little bit of comfort is that these people where they train and whether the election is May 3rd, June, July, or August, this 
training counts. It's not okay. um, wasted efforts on our part. Um, and it seems like we're starting to get some positive response to the, the adjustment in our pay increase, which is which is good. Um, and it's kind of going how we how we wanted to. And um, so that's good. Uh, the other item I wanted to hit on is point location changes. And we've been working on that for this cycle. Um, we've had places where they're going under renovation and other things. We've had to make some changes. Right now, we've had to move out of 17 polling locations, and that is impacting 46 precincts, uh, spread out over seven municipalities, and it's about 45,000 voters as of this point who would vote somewhere differently. Um, and we have, uh, we still have a couple that we need to finalize. One of them is in Euclid. We have a court, current location that's going to be going. Uh, under renovation, so we need to find a place for those individuals. Uh, the Rocket Mortgage Fieldhouse, we might have to come out of that. Yeah. Um, and that's because uh, the Cavs might actually make the playoffs. Yeah, and um, so as of now, the way the NBA is set up is the top six teams in each district, and the Cavs are in the sixth one. Yeah. And that's right in that window. So I have had a conversation with them. I said, hey, is there any way that we could carve out that one day in the playoff schedule if they were to make it, they're like, no, NBA makes that at that level. So that would be kind of sad, but uh, we have it. Well, it would be good in the one <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> sad for us. It's worthwhile to make yeah. that move. That means good things are going. Yeah. Uh, we had that. And we also just finished, you might have heard in the news recently, St. Anthony Padua in Parma caught on fire. It no, actually yes. was a whole place. Uh, and so you know, final home for that. So, this is something where it's helpful. Going through this process, I guess we identify what places are going under renovation that we'd have to move out of regardless of when the election was. Right. So there is some uh, positive effort with that. However, if the election is moved, we'll have to reach out to all our locations again with a new date to see if there's any kind of conflicts. But again, this is one of those things you can only wait so long because you need to know what's going on. So we went down this path. That's a big number of voters though too. Yeah. I, I mean, I don't recall in the past that we've had this many voters affected by relocation. I mean, my memory could be yeah. off, but I, this seems like a really big number uh, that, of voters that are affected. It's a lot. Yeah. It, unfortunately, we did. I remember one time we hit 80. I hope we never have to hit that again. But this is big. It's a big number. This is, so. this is a lot. If the elections moved, are we tied into the, the rental of those places for that day? Not. No, thanks to Mark, we have language in our contract that's with 24 hours notice, um, the board can um, get out of that. So we, what we would do is we would then send notification out to all locations, exercising that clause, um, and then setting up a new contract with whatever we would have to for that day. When will we start notifying these voters? I mean, I know you don't want to duplicate the, you know, if the, if the primaries change, so are we going to wait to notify them of changes? Or are we notifying them now, even though there could be a we are notifying send us another notice or whatever? But we're notifying them now. Okay. And in that letter, it says that your whole place has changed for the 2022 primary election. We don't say May 3rd okay. in the letter. Okay. Um, and again, seems like most of these moves are related to construction, the fire, whatever it is. So change has to happen. It's not necessarily. Um, the location has a conflict that day because they have another event. So I think this change would. We're letting them know that the, you know that the changes due to circumstances beyond our control. Uh, I think the. I mean, I just you know because sometimes people will receive yeah. that letter and and then be like, have dogs on board of elections changing. Our, I mean, it just sometimes it's helpful if that is the case. Mm -hmm. I mean, honestly, we're not we're not unilaterally changing these. We've been asked for the reasons that. And, uh, and staff is supplied uh, the phone operator. They're supplied with the reasons why okay. the changes were made. So if people have concern and they call in, um, oh, staff right. is able to give an update. Oh, that's, you know. right. yeah. but, uh, that's a good point, though, because if people get it, they're like, "Why are we changing it?" They don't, and if you can explain that the previous place, the lease is not available. It's just not available. Even if you can't customize seventy-five thousand letters right, for right. each reason, you know, change. Mm -hmm. For reasons beyond our control, or for reasons some some language, so that they are not immediately 
you know, upset with us. It's not available. It's not because we are trying to make it inconvenient for them. No, to we vote. definitely say that, that we, we appreciate the challenge that, that is. And so we do put that out there. And I think that's one of the benefits of how we have migrated where before it was your four by six postcard, and now it's a letter. It's more personal, but we put a little bit more information okay. in there. And if you can personalize it, I was just, just, you know, that's a lot of letters to personalize, but it, hey, if you we, can. No, we don't customize it to that oh, okay. level, but the, the letter we will put more like, yeah. instead of just getting a card saying, whole place is here, there you go. It's, <laughs> hey, we understand that it can be stressful changing the full place and we appreciate that. You know, so some of those kinds of You can words. identify, you know, in the past year we have been asked because of what X, Y, Z, for example, that the change, you could give them a, a little bit of a list of regions in the latter maybe. I'll leave it to you, yeah. but I think something ought to go in there. No, but I, I heard you, yeah. Okay, so now I wanna kinda hit on, I guess the, the directives and, and how this impacts Kylie County. And, you know, especially over the weekend, we were hopeful maybe that we would get uh, legal descriptions uh, from the Secretary of State's office regarding, regarding the United States Congressional Contest. Um, that didn't happen. We were maybe hoping that the Supreme Court would say either maps are good or we're going to make a decision on Monday or some of these things to give us some kind of direction. That didn't happen. Uh, what did happen? is Secretary of State got notice from the Department of Defense that the UOCAVA waiver was denied um, and UOCAVA starts on March 18th. So that's not a good thing. So you look at all these things and, and when I see what's in front of us to accomplish, at this point, I, I just don't know how we can conduct in Cuyahoga County with our size and breadth of candidates, how we can conduct an election to our standards on May 3rd. Uh, we have obstacles that are outside of our control um, that really impact how we how we do business and let, um, and, and all boards you know have a high standard and stuff. But typically we go into a process and I'm able to tell you and hopefully give you assurance that we can conduct this to our standard with a high level of accuracy. I can't say that right now. Um, and in my short tenure as director, it has been quite a roller coaster ride. Um, with 2020 and with the number of elections last year and now this. And this is actually, in my opinion, the worst scenario that this agency has been in. This is worse than the 2020 primary election that was postponed on the eve of the election. And the reason is, for that election, we were able to kick off our schedule and, and engage in our processes. We were able to... Um, create the ballot, which is the foundation of so many things that we do here. I mean, creating the ballot obviously is the ballot and it, it allows you to meet UOCAVA and vote by mail, but also you can't test uh, scanners that you use at the full place for logic and accuracy until you have, to have a ballot because a test deck of those ballots is what goes through there. And you can't pack up a scanner to ship to a point location until it has successfully completed logic and accuracy testing. So you have this domino effect. You can't put in vote by mail applications into the system until all this is set. Because if it changes, then you lose all that data entry. So we have all these obstacles in front of us. In 2020, that didn't exist. We were able to create a ballot. We could test equipment. In fact, we had the stuff out at the polls and then we had to react to the after. We can't even get to that point. So, and, and it just kind of lets you know what we do here when it comes to creating a ballot, we, 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 know, we know when election day is. And six weeks prior to that is when uh, IT and ballot will import the, the data. So they take this information from the voter registration system and it goes into the, the ballot layout software. So that's six weeks before the election. That was February 25th. And we did do that. But we did that based on the directive at that point in time, which says no General Assembly, no State Central, and no U.S. Congress. So we imported for basically statewide offices, um, county things, and, and precinct community people. So once we get that imported, it'll take Brian and his team three weeks to go through the rounds of proofing to get the ballot where 
we have 100 percent correct accuracy that everything is spelled correctly all the candidates are on there the different districts because it's not the same ballot for everybody as we know every one of those is correct and that happens three weeks after import and that falls right at the at the uacaba point which then we're able we haven't printed a ballot but what we're able to do is we can send out electronic ballots and then we know those will get remade when they come back in once you get that to that point that's then when we start the approval to print process and what that is is we send a we create a file here and we send it to the ballot so it's the midwest to print this test deck now a test deck what that does is there it's their sample ballots that will account for every oval position on all the ballots across all the precincts. That so something like this, a partisan primary that has county uh, precinct committee people can can easily be fifty thousand plus pages. It's a giant document, and the more candidates you have in a contest, the more the larger it grows. Um, so, for example, if you have ten people running. Um, for Secretary of State from one party, that's 10 oval positions that you need to rotate through, that you need to figure it out by polling location. That becomes big. That approval of the print process from, from sending over to the printer to create the test deck to get it back, then you have to parse it out by a poll location. And that, it's about a seven day process to do that. So once we get to that point and we're comfortable, and what we're testing on at that point is our central count scanners that we do vote by mail on and all of our backup scanners. So we, we tested on that population of equipment. When it's good, we give the vendor, okay, you have the approval to print ballots. That comes one week before absentee opens. By doing, and that's March 29th. And what that does then is it allows uh, Midwest to start to print uh, vote by mail packets for information we provided to that point, as well as print the ballot wall for early in person. So we have all those ballots. And by giving them a week's heads up, when opening happens on the 5th, we're able to have a fully stocked early in person uh, ballot wall, as well as get a lot of ballots out in the mail. Um, once we get that approval of print, that's now when we conduct the logic and accuracy test on all the election day stuff. So that'll be the the scanners that we send out to the polls that they'll use. So you have all of that. So you can see that there's these things that are contingent on the first piece happening to the next piece happening. What we, where we're at right now is for, for, for statewide offices, for countywide offices, we, we did that import and we started that, that proofing, that layout and proof process, but what will happen is we're going to have to now adjust the election profile and re-import. When we re-import, basically what Ryan has gets put in a drawer and he has to start afresh again. We're able to, to and before they can do the import, Brent and his shop have to actually go in now and create the election. So they have to, to build this in the voter registration database. We have been able, we got the legal descriptions for the General Assembly um, and we were able to now get those map lines correct. We were able to do the data entry um, into the voter registration database. And what that means is each precinct, we go in and we assign that precinct to its district configuration. So now you will be, for example, um, House District 21, your House District 22, and we do the same thing for the Senate. And we account for the split. So we need the legal description. Why the legal description is so important is it helps us with really with split precincts. Um, we have 14 split precincts in the General Assembly contest now. And what that mean, what a split precinct is, is a legal, the, when you get the map, they give you the map and it gives you the lines and they're pretty close and they try to follow the municipal boundaries, but it's not exact because it's, it's a map. And then they also provided the General Assembly or the redistricting commission census block data. Census blocks are important because a precinct is made up of census blocks. Sometimes it's one census block, sometimes it's multiple census blocks. So when you hear a split precinct, what that means is, is that the, the district will say, okay, if this precinct happens to have three census blocks, we wanna carve out this one census block and put it in this district, but these other two can be in that one. And the reason they do that is 
I guess when they're doing their methodology as they're trying to balance population and balance everything else they're doing, they need to make those carve outs. You don't, you can't see that accurately with math. And if you follow just hundred percent of the census blocks, you're gonna get a different result. It's this legal depth, it's this legal description where it will parse it out to that finite part. It's not an overly impressive document, but it's important when you get to those splits. So we had that for the General Assembly. We did that entry, we did all the proofing. Brett and Corey will be able to start to build that election today, but it won't include the US Congress because we don't have that legal description um, yet. So they can go ahead and they can do that and we will start to do that. And we're gonna to talk today after the meeting with the departments to make sure we wanna go down that path. And we can, cause we have that. But again, when, the, when we get the congressional legal description, we then have to start that process over again. So it's kind of like you're repeating yourself, but we're trying to get the ball as far down the field as we can with the information that we know. All knowing that we still don't have a blessing of the Supreme Court on the General Assembly maps or the U.S. Congressional ones. Now, the court did say, at least regarding the congressional maps, I believe there's a 4 p.m. deadline tomorrow for the commission to provide statements. Um, that's something, but it doesn't necessarily mean that you get a decision. So, so let me just, you know, yeah. and I understand, I mean, I appreciate you detailing all the yeah. steps and everything's related to each other clearly. And when mm -hmm. you get so far, and then there's a change, you have to redo it again. Mm -hmm. I'm, 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 yeah. I'm hard to hear that at least you're doing as much as you can with the process. Yeah. Right. But right now we don't have an approved Senate congressional maps or House maps. Is there, if you talked to staff and said, this is the drop dead date. I mean, if I don't know, if we don't know as an agency by April 1st, there's no way we can, or, you know, is there a date that's certain at this point? We're kind of past it. I, I, knew, I heard February 25th or 26th that that was sort of the deadline that. That's what we, that's definitely what we would want. Now, can we work overtime and weekends? Yes. But that would, that we were kind of looking, that would really take us to around March 4th. To, to have court approved um, maps, legal descriptions, to be able to go down that path, which was last Friday, in order to uh, meet these deadlines. And that still didn't necessarily mean we were gonna meet the UOCAVA deadline, but we would 100% go into April 5th, comfortable that I can at least tell you, we can deliver a Cuyahoga County type election, you know, if we have that. That was Friday, we're here we are on Monday and I don't have those pieces and I don't know if I'm gonna get any of those pieces this week. <coughs> so I, th I think we're there. Every day you have to wait, that's more overtime, more effort mm -hmm. on staff to, to get this work done instead of doing eight hour days and 12 hour days. Yeah, and, and, that's, and, that's, and we're already, some of these things have gone beyond and they did, they did pass more money in the legislature and that's nice. However, that is not the universal here. Um, because without these pieces, you, you can try to get more resources, but you can only expand things up so much. And then you start to, we're human. You get tired and you start to make sloppy mistakes and you can't buy more days. And that's what we need. We need more days. And this isn't unique to Chicago County. I mean, every no. board of elections in the state has, has this issue. That, that is correct. And it, but it's, it's compounded in a place like ours because we have... Um, 11, we have, I'm sorry, we have 11 House districts, four Senate districts, and now two congressional districts. So the number of House and Senate districts stayed the same. However, they're definitely not the same configuration. And then we're going from four United States congressional districts down to two. So that cuts it up a lot more where you might have a county where the whole county is one Ohio Senate district, one Ohio House district, and one congressional district because of its physical size. So for them, that's simple. You do a couple things and you're done because you're not parsing out everything. It, it's it's a county wide. But there are people like, and I'm, I'm talking with her because we try to talk through and see how we can do stuff. So definitely Franklin County is in the same boat. Summit County, Lorain County, um, Lake County, um, they're, in the, in the same position that we are and we're like how, how do you do this so what do we do as a board uh, uh, invite our legislatures and encourage them to change the primary date right i mean we can do that we definitely uh that's all that's all we really can do i guess is continue to be out there saying look at this is it cannot it cannot be done well secretary of state's office given us as much direction as they can 
Is that correct? Correct. So the, I mean, what's going to happen with the waiver issue? So it sounds like we, mm -hmm. the waiver was denied on the UOCAVA. Mm -hmm. So how are we going to comply with, do we know what the fix is legally to comply with the deadline? No. Or we simply can't comply with the deadline? So right now we can't. What I would, this is an assumption, what I would assume is that happened over the weekend that Secretary of State is going to have to come out with a new directive, giving us some kind of guidance and in, in direction. What that will be is, I don't know, um, and I, I just don't know. And, and even the even the directive that we do have, it tells you know the, the directive will say go ahead, boards of elections, go ahead and start reprogramming your voter registration database. We can't do that just based on that. We, but he also later on says in the directive that a legal description will be forthcoming. That's the that's the piece that that we need. So even though the directive say say the directive comes out on Monday. If you don't get the legal description until Friday, you know Monday through Thursday is lost production time that you can't do what you need to do because you didn't have the tool. I, I actually, I just want to make a couple of comments because I, I, I really have sleepless nights about the work we do here because we do it so well, but I'm having sleepless nights about this issue. And I hear, um, and I'm, ha I'm happy that our um, you know, Ohio Association of election officials has, you know, issued a couple statements and tried to, and letters to try to encourage the movement on this. To me, this is not a partisan, it is a partisan primary, but it's not a partisan issue. This is an election official administration issue. And I hear our director saying we're at a crossroads in terms of being able to successfully execute and administer a May 3rd primary. So I, I just want to, I just wrote some notes to myself because that's just how I am. And I just want to get them on the record. Just, and this is just my own view. Uh, and I think the difference um, in 2020, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, even though we got a last minute change, which we were hoping not to get that ninth hour news, there's mm -hmm. going to be a change. But there, I don't think there was any litigation. Was there litigation back then? Overlaying that process? I don't recall. I mean, there was a lot of stuff going, a lot of moving parts, but I don't recall that we actually had this kind of litigation mm -hmm on top of it but anyways I, I, I well I, I would say and i'm not exactly sure but i don't remember a litigation like this and i think that was more actually internal fighting between the legislature and the governor slash secretary of state yeah. as far as who has the authority to set the election yeah I don't that think, wasn't litigation yeah no no so, we, so anyways i here's i just want to say these couple things if i if with the right. indulgence of my colleagues here um so you know i think that uh, i understand everybody's working hard uh to navigate and trying to navigate these uncertainties uh related to redistricting and then the litigation that's in process we've been following um the direction from our secretary of state to do all the things required for may 3rd and appreciate the direction we're getting uh because we understand he's challenged as well um and so we've been working to that but despite our best efforts it to me appears that we do not have all that we need to be ready for may 3rd primary election, uh, we're unable to prepare the ballots. I mean, it just seems to me that is so fundamental to this process. And if the need, with the inability to prepare the ballots, I don't know what, what we're gonna do. Um, we talked about the denial of the waiver and you know we don't know how we're gonna comply with that de deadline. And I know we're gonna get additional instruction from our chief uh, elections officer on that. Um, so, I mean, our staff and this organization gets 150% to prepare for every election, large and small. But as you say, it's a process that requires sufficient time for each necessary task that has to be accomplished. We know you've been working feverishly to try to accomplish all of those things for May 3rd as instructed. Uh, but I think we're at a turning point and we don't have what we need to do uh, to prepare the basic ballot. And I don't think the answer is to have two primary elections. I mean, I think that would put an extraordinary burden on the agencies and, and it's more about, it's not only money to your point, um, it's about the resources we have to assemble uh, and, and get together and people, the people resources we need. And I'm really concerned about the potential for voter confusion, especially if we get the last minute, okay, we're gonna switch. If we know large counties and probably some smaller counties too, are where we are at this point, and there's so many uncertainties, I just think that we need somebody to be thoughtful and proactive um, and, and move this thing out. I just don't see how we can do a May 3rd, given what you've said today. I mean, it would be great. I mean, I'm not excited about having an election other than what we've already planned for and everybody in candidates and voters and everybody thinks we're having a May 3rd primary, but it doesn't make any sense. 
And it doesn't make any sense to me from an administrative election. This is not partisan, other than it's a partisan primary. But this is, you know, we don't, should, there shouldn't be fighting. We can't successfully, is what I hear you saying, we're at a crossroads, effectively administer the kind of election that we are used to doing in this county. And it's cause for concern as far as I'm keeping me up at night. And so I would hope um, that somehow, uh, if we are really at a point of no return, that um, we get some our, the folks and all the stakeholders uh, that making the decisions to figure out uh, to move this thing to one election out far enough that gives us the ability to do what we need to do. I, it's just my own opinion. I mean, yeah, I would love to have a May 3rd primary election. I just don't think we can do it. And we need to level set expectations for the voters and for our, all the stakeholders that we potentially could have problems if this doesn't get sorted out quickly. Thank you for your thoughtful comments. Um, good morning. So what do you do? I know. Um, I mean, we, I, you know, I, I could draft a letter on behalf of all the members and we can send it to the president of the Senate and, and the Speaker of the House. And, you know, it was just a, yeah. I mean, I, I, I'll circulate something like that and then get your edits on it. That would be great. You know, at um, least we feel like we're doing something. Yeah, I mean, I think we just have to go on record. I mean, we've kind of been quiet and silent and not to create a problem, a kind of create a problem uh, or interject, you know, more of, you know, craziness into the process. But I think we are duty bound to, to speak to this as a board, I mean, especially given the report we've gotten today from our director. The secretary and the attorney general have written to the speaker in the Senate, and, and, and so has the OAA that has done it. So, I don't think there's any reason why we just as an agency if, if we feel if, if that's what our board members want to do then i, I support that i would i would support that as well yeah. terrific thank you i mean i don't know i wish we could end it up on a high note tony i know yeah. I, uh, <laughs> I, and, I'm, and i will say this that one and you already know this amazing mm -hmm. however oh, yeah. you can yeah. only do so much and and um and we appreciate this. I don't know if we say it enough, um, but we just, I try to say, hey, we know you guys do 150%, yeah. uh, and, and, and everything's fluid. And so we certainly are appreciative of all of the work and the work and then the rework and then the back and forth. But I think um, in addition to fairness to the voters in the county and fairness to the staff, you know, some, something's got to give here and it just doesn't make sense. So you had commented about us meeting again, possibly we may have to if what, maps are approved or? Yeah, so there is, um, in current directive, March 14th is the certification deadline for candidates to, uh, to the General Assembly, as well as um, State Central and U.S. Congressional. So that's a week um, from today. And... Um, and, that, and that would just just like how we do a typical certification, we would, we would come through that. Um, it would, what I would think is be a, just a five minute meeting. I wouldn't want to look, load up with, I think a full meeting. So, so you, you, we may have to meet on the 14th. You don't know. Well, what happens this week? right, it yeah. depends. Right, if you don't get any news this week, we don't meet on the 14th. Uh, well, like I said, as of today, the directive says that's the, the certification. So, all right, so should, we, should we plan on meeting on the 14th? I think we, I think we should. should. I think we should. Comply with the directive. We should yes. work for anybody's schedule. Yeah. So yeah, we, I'm okay. 14th. Okay. Yeah. At 9:30. That's yeah, fine. Okay. Fine. Yeah. If if it if if there isn't a need to meet, you'll let us know. Exactly. If Mary, then you'll get the notices out. Okay. Yeah. So. All right. Why did I think there was a 17th? What, why did I think there was a 17th? Uh, March, 17th, was March 17th. March 17th is the candidate <sighs> protest deadline. Oh. So you have to have certify them first right. and then so you can have that. So, I mean, there's still, okay. even to that, March 17th is a candidate deadline. But also, also is crazy. We have a March 26th deadline that if anyone in the General Assembly, you know, by, by March 10th, they're supposed to notify us if they want to change districts. And then if they do do that, then by the 26th of March, they're supposed to update their voter registration to live where they want to run. So I, even that you have that Did I piece. I see something in the directive and it may change that as long as they do the initial notification or give us the, the burden then falls on us as the board of the board to make any changes after the district, the district is 
return. I mean, I, I, I mean, my eyes were glazing over at some point, but I thought that, I mean, to the secretaries, uh, it was a good thing to try to put the burden on us at some point if there's been no change um, and the initial filing was made by the candidates, then we would be then obligated to, you know, create the change in the direct. I, I, I don't know. I yeah. thought I read that that yeah, there is became some, our obligation and not really the candidates. But. There is something for the General Assembly. If they don't notify us by March 10th um, of their desire to move, then we, then Board of Elections, mm -hmm. look to where do they live, okay. what is the district, and that's where you're going. Okay, you're saying it much more artfully than I could have. Yeah. <laughs> but, I, but to be honest with you, these directives all start to blur and intermingle yeah. um, for me. And that's, yeah, there's a lot. Any other new business? I don't have any other new business. Mr. Gallagher, okay. Mary, any public comment? No. Okay. And so we will adjourn them today and uh, come back here on the 14th if necessary. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you all. Have a wonderful week. Thank you.